comforting drug, stronger than poppy, unquote. Mainly some to dismiss his judgment. In fact, I left his judgment till last to read after having been sent that quote. Um, it is ill advised, however, to dismiss his judgment. Justice Hayden supports a wide reading of Section 7 and a remedial interpretation of Section 32, which sits within the New Zealand and the UK model, such that he becomes the fourth judge in the majority on these issues, even though, even though the consequence of his broad reading is to invalidate Section 7, Section 32, and indeed the entire Charter. <laughs> For current purposes, Hayden begins by outrightly rejecting the Court of Appeal's um, uh, characterisation of Section 32 as being a codification of the principle of legality. Justice Hayden also... comes up, yeah. In, um, um, Justice Hayden also holds that in assessing what human rights exist before the Section 32 process um, of interpretation is completed, it is necessary to apply Section 7 to the protected rights in Part 2. So having recognised and established the operation of Section 7.2 and confirmed that the New Zealand slash UK method of analysis um, with Section 7.2 being before Section 32, Justice Hayden then proceeds to invalidate Section 7.2 because it impermissibly imposes legislative tasks on judges. In other words, he says that Section 7.2 confers functions on the Victorian courts which could not be conferred on a court in a cable sense. Separation of judicial powers under the Federal Constitution. In terms of um, Section 32, his honour holds that Section 32 goes well beyond the common law. Indeed, he muses that, quote, there would be no point in Section 32.1 unless its function was to go further than the common law principle of legality. The function of Section 32 evidently is to make up for the putative failure of the common law rules, unquote. I could not put it better myself. Significantly, his honour seems to go so far as to sanction Gaydon type analysis. And I'll give you a quote again. In effect, Section 32 permits the court to disregard the express language of a statute when something not contained in the statute itself, called its purpose, can be employed to justify the result the court considers proper. Unquote. Again, although Justice Hayden accepted the appellant's submission on the breadth of Section 32, he's honoured then used that as a, a reason to invalidate it because it impermissibly conferred legislative functions on the judiciary. So Justice Hayden's reasoning on 7 and 32 form part of the majority on those issues, even though um, his conclusions lead to invalidation. So very, very quickly, three implications. Um, how do you bear majority seemingly in favour of the New Zealand slash UK method um, under which Section 32 is a special rule of remedial interpretation and Section 7 does link in with the rights is one thing. The next question is what the strength of that remedy is going to be. Will it be a narrow remedy, uh, a broad remedy, or somewhere in the middle? Um, the judge is not clear about the strength of the remedy, and indeed the judges um, at the lower courts both in um, DAS and in um, RJE were not clear about the strength of that remedy. One thing is certain, however, the majority of judges are much more comfortable in aligning the Victorian Charter with the New Zealand Bill of Rights, but not with the UK Human Rights Act. So a closer analysis of the New Zealand jurisprudence may prove more fruitful in the future than debates about Gaydan, RBA and Wilkinson. Moreover, what are the implications for our federal human rights instruments? I only wish to make one point here. Everyone was expecting a battle between Section 36 of the Victorian Charter and separation of judicial powers under the Commonwealth Constitution. And that's what James will talk about. But I do not think that anyone was expecting a battle between the Section 7.2 limitations provision and the separation of judicial power. In my view, a limitations provision is indispensable to any human rights instrument. So this means to me that the federal debate seems to have shifted from a debate about human rights versus democracy or um, judicial supremacy versus constitutional supremacy, judicial supremacy versus parliamentary sovereignty types of debates, to a debate about human rights versus our peculiar form of constitutional separation of power under the Constitution. And that to me is perverse, because the separation of powers under the Commonwealth Constitution is usually held 
um, um, usually used to uphold human rights through the back door, but now it's going to be used um, to possibly undermine a front door human rights instrument. The significance of this shift is yet to be explored. Oops, by way of conclusion, I hark back to Justice Hayden's comments about human rights being a comforting drug. I'm not sure whether human rights are an illicit drug or not, but being in possession of my Victorian charter makes me suddenly nervous. Could I possibly be automatically deemed to be in possession of drugs for the purposes of trafficking? On that note, I don't leave the left turn lest my paper is considered a sales pitch. Thank you. Thank you. 
the High Court has developed limitations on what state parliaments can do with their courts. Uh, these cable principles arise largely because Section 77.3 allows the Commonwealth Parliament to vest federal jurisdiction and Commonwealth judicial power in state courts, and amongst other things, prevents state parliaments from conferring functions and powers on state courts which are incompatible with the exercise of Commonwealth judicial power. And that test has, since cable, been refined to one of institutional integrity. Fourthly, um, the High Court has suggested that the Commonwealth Parliament has the exclusive power to decide what laws can be applied when a court, whether federal or state, is exercising federal jurisdiction. Now, as a consequence of that, when a state court is exercising federal jurisdiction, state laws conferring powers on state courts cannot apply of their own force. They have to be picked up and applied by a federal court provision and applied as a surrogate federal law. Now, this is largely achieved by two provisions in the Judiciary Act, um, Section 68.1 and Section 79.1, uh, and 79.1 will be of most relevance um, for us this afternoon. Uh, importantly, uh, as I mentioned, the Boilermakers Principle tells us that Parliament can't confer non-judicial power on courts, um, unless, of course, they're incidental to the exercise of judicial power. Now, what Parliament can't do directly, it can't do indirectly, so Section 68.1 and 79.1 of the Judiciary Act can't pick up state provisions conferring powers or functions on state courts which are non-judicial or non-incidental non-judicial. And finally, the High Court sits at the top of the judicial hierarchy in Australia and it hears appeals from lower state and federal courts. However, Section 73 of the Constitution provides that the appellate jurisdiction of the High Court will only arise from a judgment, decree, order or sentence. And the High Court has accepted that a judgment, decree, order or sentence can only arise when the lower court is exercising judicial power. So with those five key Chapter 3 features in mind, um, we can turn to tackle the Monchilovich uh, and Monsilovich uh, questions. Um, and the answers to these questions will have implications not only for state and territory human rights schemes, uh, but also for any future federal scheme designed in the same way. Um, now, the core questions that arose in Monsilovich, uh, first of all, does the Declaration of Inconsistency, uh, or the application of the interpretive rule for that matter, uh, involve an exercise of common law judicial power. Now, I probably should have separated those out into separate questions, um, uh, and I've since added some more to the paper on the, the compatibility of the interpretive rule with judicial power, um, but anyway, it's, it's the same question. Secondly, if not, uh, is it incidental to the exercise of judicial power? Thirdly, is the declaration or the interpretive rule incompatible with an exercise of common law judicial power. So that's the cable question. Uh, fourthly, was the Supreme Court exercising federal jurisdiction? If so, would the interpretive rule and the declaration be picked up and applied in federal jurisdiction by Section 79.1 of the Judiciary Act? And then finally, could a declaration of inconsistency be taken on appeal to the High Court? Now, prior to the Monsilovich case, the constitutional commentary on these questions was deeply divided, and so it's probably no surprise to see the High Court splitting on most of these questions. Importantly, the split in many cases depended on the view taken as to the relevance of the justification provision in Section 72 of the Charter to the process of interpretation and declaration. And as we'll see, this complicates the assessment of a case at almost every turn. Now, I hope to bring some clarity um, to the issues, um, but I apologise if I don't. Now, first, let me tackle the question of the interpretive rule. Now, for six judges, the interpretive rule <coughs> could be applied in the exercise of common law judicial power. But the position is not as clear-cut as it seems. Three of those judges, Justices Gummer, Hayne and Bell, reached the conclusion on the basis that Section 
was relevant to the interpretive process. The other three judges, Chief Justice French, Justices Crennan and Kiefel, thought that Section 7.2 was not relevant to the interpretive process. Now, Justice Hayden concluded that Section 7.2 was relevant to the interpretive process, uh, and I'll, I'll come back to um, his honest judgment um, uh, in a moment. Uh, but his honour held that the process of interpretation does not involve the way he read the interpretive provisions. That process of interpre interpretation does not involve an exercise of judicial power. So we're one judge short in, in, fine, in terms of finding a majority from the court that would hold that the interpretive provision can be applied in the exercise of common law judicial power when, or on the basis that the justification provision is relevant to that interpretive process. Now, it's not entirely clear if the other three judges, that is Chief Justice French, Justices Crennan and Kiefel, would reach the same conclusion about its constitutionality, would reach the same conclusion about the interpretive provision if they had taken Section 7.2 into account, or if it was a factor in the interpretive process. The Chief Justice specifically says, and I quote, that the justification of limitations on human rights is a matter for the Parliament. And this may suggest that His Honour might not accept an interpretive process that allowed the courts to apply the justification provision. As for Justices Crennan and Kiefel, there's no clear indication either way, uh, and I think it comes down to trying to read between the lines, which is always a little bit dangerous, <coughs> and it's, uh, I think, a, a, a little more speculative than, than uh, reading between the lines of the Chief Justice's uh, judgment. So it's not clear. Um, turning to Justice Hayden, Justice Hayden held that the interpretive rule didn't involve an exercise of judicial power. First, because the application of the justification provision in Section 7.2 involved the application of vague criteria not capable of judicial application and because working out whether a breach of a right could be justified was essentially a legislative task that had been delegated here to the judiciary. Secondly, His Honour said, even without the justification provision, uh, His Honour thought that the interpretive rule in section 32.1 should be, should be read to allow a remedial re-reading of a provision to achieve a purpose that departed from its meaning. And that, for His Honour, involved an exercise of legislative power. Now, the other judges obviously disagreed. Uh, any rights, protective readings or re-readings of the law uh, for the other judges, would not allow a view of the purpose which departed from its range of acceptable meanings. Now, before moving off the interpretive rule, um, let me engage in some speculation. Um, what if the minority view were accepted about the interpretive rule? That is, what if we were, what if the interpretive rule was seen as a statutory codification of the presumption of legality? Now, I think that all seven judges, uh, and potentially even Justice Hayden, uh, all seven judges would uh, consider that to survive constitutional scrutiny. Now, as for the Declaration, all seven judges held that the Declaration does not involve an exercise of common law judicial power, and the core line of reasoning the um, core line of reasoning here was that the Declaration had no legal operation. It doesn't affect the validity of the provision and has no impact on the party's legal rights. And to describe it as a declaration was considered to misdescribe its nature in the hands of the judiciary. Well, if the Declaration was not an exercise of judicial power, could it be seen as an exercise of non-judicial power, incidental to the exercise of judicial power? Four judges, Chief Justice French, Justices Gummo, Hain and Hayden, clearly held that it could not be seen as an exercise of incidental non-judicial power. The core reasoning of those four judges was that the declaration was an add-on to the judicial process that didn't assist in any way with the resolution of the dispute between the parties. Now, Justice Bell generally agreed with the Chief Justice's conclusion that the declaration was non-judicial. <coughs> 
But Her Honour didn't specifically say anything about whether or not it was incidental. So it might be four or it might be five judges on this point, but certainly a majority of the judges for the view that the declaration did not involve an exercise of incidental non-judicial power. Now it's important again to pause to highlight the interaction between these conclusions and the views the judges took of the nature of the interpretive rule. And here we can, uh, we can again see the complications in the overall analysis of the case coming through. So Justices Gummo, Hayne and Hayden were of the view that the justification provision in Section 7.2 was relevant both to the interpretive process and, and the making of the declaration. But um, because the declaration didn't do anything for the parties, uh, their honours thought that it wasn't incidental to the resolution of their dispute. Chief Justice French held that Section 7.2 was only relevant to the point of exercising a discretion to make a declaration. Now, this was not a view held by any of the other judges. Uh, given, that the view, given that the view of the relevance of Section 7.2 to the declaration process, but not to the interpretive process, one might think that the declaration could not be seen as incidental to the interpretive process because the interpretive process did not involve the application of Section 7.2. So one might say that the declaration stage involved a further add-on assessment not undertaken at the interpretive stage and therefore not incidental. However, that doesn't appear to have been the basis of the Chief Justice's conclusion that the declaration was not incidental as he merely emphasised, like Justices Gummo, Hayne and Hayden, that the declaration did not assist in any way in resolving the party's dispute. Now, as I've said, Justice Bell thought that Section 7.2 was relevant to both the interpretive process and the making of the declaration, but Her Honour didn't say anything specifically about whether the declaration was incidental. Uh, Her Honour merely agreed generally with Chief Justice French's conclusion that the declaration was not an exercise of judicial power. Only Justices Crennan and Kiefel held that the declaration involved an exercise of incidental non-judicial power. And the core reason here was that the declaration was really just a statement of conclusion about the reasoning that had been applied in the interpretive process. Importantly, however, their honours reached that conclusion on the basis of their view that Section 7.2 did not affect either the interpretive process or the making of the declaration. And Your Honour said that the conclu their conclusion might be different if Section 7.2 was excluded from the interpretive process but then made relevant to the making of a declaration. That, of course, was the view of the Chief Justice. But unlike Chief Justice French, for Justices Crennan and Kiefel, the disparity between the non-use of Section 7.2 in the interpretive process and its use in making the declaration would render the declaration non-incidental. So, let me give you a bit of a summary. Um, sum summary on the declaration, whether the, or not the declaration um, can be, it involves an exercise of common law judicial power. Five judges held that, uh, sorry, seven judges held, sorry, I'm getting myself confused. Um, <laughs> Uh, seven judges held that it didn't involve an exercise of common law judicial power, uh, and four or five of the judges held that it was not that it's not incidental to an exercise of judicial power. And these positions are probably not affected by whether the process of interpretation and declaration involves an application of the justification provision in section 7.2. So, what effect does all of that have on legislative design. First, um, it's, possible, uh, it's possible that the interpretive provision could be put into a federal charter, especially if it just codifies the principle of legality, but the declaration could not be put into a federal charter. Although none of the judges commented on a federal charter, I think those conclusions necessarily follow. Secondly, when the Victorian Supreme Court is exercising federal jurisdiction, Section 791 of the Judiciary Act 
may be able to pick up the interpretive provision in section 32.1, perhaps even as interpreted by a majority to involve an application of the justification provision, but it will not operate to pick up the declaration provision. This was the specific finding of three judges, Chief Justice French, Justices Gummo and Hain, uh, but would necessarily have been the finding of Justice Hayden uh, if his honour didn't invalidate the entire legislation, and may well have been the finding of Justice Bell if her honour had specifically addressed the question. Uh, thirdly, um, we can knock over the, the final question there, question five, um, a declaration of incompatibility, even when made by the, by the State Supreme Court, by the Victorian uh, Supreme Court, when exercising state judicial power, cannot be appealed to the High Court. Now, that was the specific finding of Chief, Chief Justice French, but would have necessarily followed the Justices Gummo, Hayne and Hayden, if their honours had invalidated the declaration provision, and may have also followed the Justice Bill as well. Now, I'd like to uh, pause to reflect on two points. Actually, I'll turn it to one, given that I'm short of time. The first observation was about the ATT Human Rights Act, um, but given I'm in Victoria, I, I won't. Um, the thrust of the point is that um, the position in the ATT is even more precarious than it is in Victoria. Uh, but I'll move to the second point. Um, and this is um, in, in what appears to be a passing comment by the Chief Justice. Um, his Honour said that even where the Victorian Supreme Court is exercising federal jurisdiction, it may be that the declaration can be given by the court in state jurisdiction after the federal jurisdiction has run its course. Now, I think that's a problematic suggestion, um, which doesn't sit comfortably with either the way uh, the Charter is currently designed or previous High Court decisions. Um, in the case of Solomon's, um, the High Court had to consider New South Wales legislation that allowed a New South Wales court to grant a costs indemnity certificate after a verdict had been given in the exercise of federal criminal jurisdiction. The High Court in that case proceeded on the assumption that the New South Wales court was still exercising federal jurisdiction when it was asked to give a cost certificate and concluded that the certificate could not be given because it, it did not involve an exercise of judicial power. Now, given the way in which the charter provisions are currently designed, I think it's unlikely that federal jurisdiction will have been exhausted when the Supreme Court makes a declaration. Uh, structurally, the declaration is made in immediately following a conclusion that a provision is rights inconsistent. There is no separate conferral of jurisdiction to make a conferral or a separate process for applying for a declaration. And it's certainly much closer to the exercise of federal judicial power than the cost certificate was in Solomon's. The idea that the Supreme Court can decide that federal jurisdiction has come to an end and that a declaration could then be made in state jurisdiction doesn't sit comfortably with uh, existing principles of how federal jurisdiction operates. Now, the Chief, Chief Justice didn't give a concluded view on the point um, because uh, the court had no appellate jurisdiction to consider the declaration. Um, however, I think it needs some further thought. Um, I think a stronger case uh, might be made for a differently designed uh, provision that sets up a separate procedure for a person, preferably not a party, um, to get a declaration. So, now to the remaining issues. Um, the declaration uh, could not be picked up by Section 7791 of the Judiciary Act if the court were exercising federal jurisdiction. Um, so was the Court of Appeal exercising federal jurisdiction? federal jurisdiction, well, five judges held that since the appellant had moved to Queensland at the time of the prosecution, there was federal jurisdiction because the criminal prosecution involved a matter between Victoria and a resident of another state. And now, that point had escaped the trial court, the Court of Appeal, and all the parties and interveners during the High Court Appeal until the point was raised by Western Australia well into the case. Um, the fact that federal jurisdiction can be exercised without anyone's knowledge um, creates some real practical problems for the continuing operation of the declaration provisions. Um, the final issue is the cable one. Uh, for many years, cable lay dormant. Um, however, over the last couple of years, it has rebounded in the most vigorous way. Um, the High Court has relied upon cable reasoning to invalidate state legislation in international finance trust, in Titani, Kirk and Wanahu, and only by the slimmest margin 
was capable in validity of the declaration provision avoided in this case. So, all the judges in Montilovich, Montilovich seem to be on the same page on the statement of principle. State parliaments can't confer powers or, or functions on state courts if they're incompatible with an exercise of judicial power, if they're incompatible with the court's institutional integrity. And I think it's fair to say that four judges, Chief Justice French, Justice Bell, Justices Crennan and Kiefel, four judges applied the test in the same way. In making a declaration, the court was act acting independently and impartially, with no suggestion that it was rubber stamping a predetermined outcome by the executive. And on top of that, it was not forced to make a declaration under the legislation. It could exercise the discretion not to. Now, it may have been significant to this conclusion that Chief Justice French and Justices Crennan and Kiefel didn't see a role for Section 7.2 in the interpretive process. At least in Chief Justice French's judgment, there seems to be an indication that the application of the justification provision might involve a legislative function, a function that was preserved for the legislature by his honours interpretation of the interpretive process to exclude Section 7.2. And to complicate things further for the declaration provision, um, Justices Crennan and Kiefel thought it advisable that the Supreme Court not make a declaration in criminal cases, at least where a person has been convicted, as the court would in those circumstances be upholding a conviction against the law that was said by the court to be human rights inconsistent. Um, Justices Gummo, Hayne and Hayne, uh, Hayden reached a different conclusion. For Justices Gummo and Hayne, the declaration involved the courts in law reform. The declaration said in, in train a process where the executive and the legislature would decide whether to amend the law and that undermined the court's institutional integrity. For Justice Hayden, the entire process um, involved a legislative function and um, using Kirk type of reasoning, the conferral of legislative functions on courts would impermissibly deny them the character of a court for Chapter 3 purposes. So, in summary, um, the declaration provision has survived in validity under Cable, um, although we should be conscious that for three of the majority judges, their conclusion was based on an approach to the interpretive rule that excluded consideration of the justification provision in Section 7.2. Okay, I am running short of time, so I will just make a couple of comments on Section 102, but I'm happy to expand upon those comments during questions. Um, the Section 102, sorry, 102, 109. The Section 109 issue arise, uh, arose fairly late in the day as a consequence of the High Court's decision in Dixon and the Queen. Um, so in, in Dixon and the Queen, um, the High Court uh, held that there was an in inconsistency between a Commonwealth uh, provision, um, conspiracy um, um, to uh, steal, got that wording wrong, um, an inconsistency between a Commonwealth provision and a state provision essentially um, uh, criminali criminalising uh, the same conduct um, because, and, and held there was an inconsistency because the federal provisions had um, deliberately designed, in the court's view, had deliberately designed the scope of the federal provision in a way that was more limited than the scope of the state provision and since the state provision uh, took away from the scope of the federal provision, there was an inconsistency. Now, that understandably has created some anxiety um, at both the Commonwealth level and at the state level for um, law enforcement policy makers and law enforcement uh, agencies. Uh, and Section 109 uh, and the um, Juan Silovich case uh, gave the High Court another opportunity to consider a similar type of argument. And the argument in this case was that um, the state, um, um, that the state provision um, had, had deemed um, 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 Ms. Monsilovich to be in possession of the drugs for the purposes of uh, the trafficking offence. Um, she argued that the deeming provision would not have operated for a similar um, federal offence, and therefore there was inconsistency, um, and um, the state provision was invalid. Um, the High Court um, quite neatly sidestepped the argument by saying that the deeming provision didn't, at the state level didn't in fact apply to the relevant offence and therefore there was no inconsistency 
um, between the state and federal law. Um, there were some other differences between the federal provision and the state provision, uh, but the High Court um, in the various judgments um, or insist the judgments conveniently sort of explained away those various differences. Um, I think the upshot is that uh, despite the fact that the High Court held that there was no inconsistency in the Monsilovich case, I don't think that gives us any confidence, uh, any greater confidence about the position following Monsilovich, Monsilovich um, that, than, um, than uh, existed prior to that case, prior to the Monsilovich case. So, I might leave it there. I'm happy to um, elaborate uh, in questions.